Morning all. I had an interesting over the board game last night. It was in the Hertfordshire League. So Barnett were playing away at Hemel Hempstead. My opponent was Steve Law, who's about 184 at the moment. He kicked off with E4. I think this game's interesting because the end games weren't as clear as, as I'd hoped for. So there was a bit of optimism crept in. So maybe some more accurate and, and tactical possibilities could have been explored instead of um, going into this endgame which visually looked good. Uh, so okay, so I play the French defence. He plays d4, d5, and after knight c3 um, I invite the closing of the centre, so knight f6, the, cl the classical, rather than the winner, which is bishop b4. So he plays bishop g5. I don't mind the burn variation which I played a lot, especially in blitz, d takes e4. So I was expecting um, knight takes e4 and bishop f6 to double my pawns. But after knight takes e4, bishop e7, he surprised me. He actually played knight g3. I thought this was kind of a passive move. Um, with bishop f6 doubling the pawns, you know, that changes the whole uh, imbalances of the position. You know, double pawns versus g-file pressure. And, you know, my, my usual plan would be like to finish us to the bishop. Maybe knight d7, queen c7, castle queen side. But here it's it's interesting. I I, I didn't think c6 was maybe uh, the best, most effective reaction to this knight being here. And still having this knight controlling these squares. So I lashed out in the centre instead. I played c5. Thinking that, you know, maybe I can I can give the opponent, uh, Steve, a nice little queen's pawn. But um, he took on c5, inviting the queen exchange. But uh, my other possibility is a qu queen a5 check, which I took. So I was, I was feeling quite comfortable with this, uh, the outcome of this opening, because I thought, you know, surely I, I've equalized here. I exchange off queens. So bishop takes c5. And the reason, I mean, if we look at this, okay, white's got potential 3 to 2 um, poor majority here. And I've got a push pull majority in the centre, but that's inhibited um, by White's, uh, se you know, e, e file pressure, and this this is inhibited by by my c file pressure. So our pull majorities are not um, that exploitable, I would say, for both sides here. But um, he's, he gets a head start in his pull majority with his next move, which is bish which is b4. So I'm wondering, you know, if Bishop b6. I'm wondering, you know, maybe c4. In fact, let's this engine check this. Off the, off the bishop b6, would that be such a bad retreat to encourage c4? I thought intuitively this might not be so hot. c4 is not really liked that much by my my Ribka here, but it's it's. Then again, it's it's about equal anyway. Okay, let's turn off the engine now. So knight f3 was played here instead. So I, I went to e7. So my idea actually is, you know, I can later harass this pawn with knight c6, and maybe even try and get control of c5, like in a recent Magnus Carlsen and Blitz game. You know, getting control of c5, that nice grip. So here, knight c6, and now I, I put this plan into action a5, trying to undermine White's control of c5. So b5, I don't mind the knight retreat. The knight could. Uh, Come back with a vengeance on the square. You know, maybe I can play b6. It's all going to look rosy. Maybe I can finish this with a bishop. But um, he interrupts this plan. He plays knight e5. I'm thinking still, you know, knight d7. If, even if I lose this knight for that knight, it's, it's not so bad. I'll have the semi open c file blockade um, on that c pawn. So I play knight bd7. He takes. I take. Okay, the bishop's a bit hemmed in by this pawn. I don't really want to play e5 at any point because white's um, pressure on the e file on this this diagonal could could be unpleasant. So I keep solid here. I just I just castle, and now I play b6, which releases my rook from protection of a5. So far, so good. And um, after rook fd1, I play rook a c8. So I've got nice uh, square to play with c5. I've got nice semi open c file pressure. He plays a4. Okay, weakens some of the dark squares a little bit. Uh, rook fd8 with vague tactical light pressure, which um, doesn't actually win any material at the moment. Uh, so king f1, bishop e8. 
tucking away my bishop on e8. It looks pretty with the two bishops like that. I thought the rooks are connected. It's a pleasant position. You know, knight d fives maybe. You know, to b4. It's it's a pleasant looking position. But knight e4 now, and he's putting a real question here. Do I want to uh, exchange or knight d5 or or this maneuver, which is made less effective because he's controlling c5 at the moment. I thought, well, I'll still go for c5 because I can kick this knight with f5 maybe. So knight d7. But after bishop e3, um, f5 is not immediately uh, playable, I thought, because of knight g5 hitting e6. So I prepare it with h6. Also, any tactical possibilities with whoops, bishop takes h7 to rule out by this move. He plays f3, which I think, you know, maybe weakens these, these dark squares a bit. And here, after f5, knight d2, I, I think um, intuitively this might be a good idea. Just get rid of that dark square bishop. You know, make emphasize my control on the dark squares. After bishop takes, I did have a um, think about uh, rook takes c5, but um, I decided in the end actually knight c5 is not that bad. You know, I was actually thinking here, uh, knight takes c5, if knight c4. Um, you know, rook b8 might might be okay, but in fact, in this position, white's more than fine with knight e5. In fact, Ribka checking this knight in this position, knight takes a4 is is a good move. Just trying to tactically use this pin. So rook takes a4, bishop takes b5. On knight takes b6, there's rook c6. It's all very tactical. I didn't see any of this combination <laughs> just as well. I just wanted to try and play positionally. So here this this sort of position should be okay for, for me slightly better. Okay, but um anyway, he, he bypassed all of that. He played bishop c four in any case. So maybe that's like less critical rather than knight c four. Knight c four seemed you know kind of logical actually to go for that. So maybe that was the first kind of sign I wasn't totally, you know, with this game, with the details of the positions. <laughs> Just, just a bit of a routine um, positional idea here, without thinking too much. But actually, b6 was exploitable um, if I didn't have that combination, especially. Okay, uh, so bishop f7 here. I was thinking, you know, maybe e5 next, and then I'll go back to work on the on the c2 pawn. So king e2, and here I think this is like a nice maneuver. Knight b7 to come to d6. I think this this was um, an interesting move, um, and in fact, um, in fact though there's there's a stronger move. Ripka checking this with a very interesting idea that I'm actually tying down this this rook to the a4 pawn. So rook d4, which I'd ruled out because of c3, and I thought nothing much else about it. But actually, there is there is a detail here. C3. The detail is that I can play rook h4. Okay, so I'm getting another tempo because you know why has to defend this. But if it does so, now there's rook d8 threatening immediately. Rook takes d2 and rook takes c4, and it's not so easy for white here. So um, c3 wouldn't be so hot, but maybe like bishop b3. But again, knight takes b3. Rook c2, black stands better, I believe. So, um, okay, I missed that opportunity there. I play knight b7, which I thought was a nice positional move again. Bishop b3, now knight d6. Okay, because I'm thinking I'm going to liberate with e5, the position a bit. So, knight f1, and I thought this is fairly passive. So, e5 takes, I'm thinking um, this is a really nice, you know, kind of position to work from. So he's got immediate problems. How does he defend c2? Well, he defends it with rook d2, which allows me this juicy looking uh, move knight c4. And I'm thinking this is plain sailing from here, surely, because um, you know he takes the rooks, but now he can't play rook d1. If he does, then rook takes d1 and knight b2 check, winning a4. Okay, and then coming out quite easily. So, um, but he wriggles here very resourcefully. <laughs> he plays actually c3 with the idea that he's going to contest these two guys with the d2 square, I like this. So uh, f4, sealing off that knight, thinking I'm cementing my advantage. 
Rook A2. I'm thinking it's really plain sailing here. Surely this this looks fairly uh, crushing. King E6, but now Knight D2. So he's arranged uh, Knight D2 in the E4 square. Now here's a bit of confusion. <laughs> this is where Rivka seems to be um, misassessing the king and pawn ending. Initially last night it was indicating as I was much better here, but actually um, let's have a look at this. This king and pawn ending is quite tricky. King d5, king d3, and here if g5, c4 check, and I think this is okay for white because this this variation where white sacrifices the c4 pawn and then goes for the b6 pawn uh, should should be at least equal. Or if and if I misplay it, it will be even even better for him. If we look at say h3 and c5, this this position here um, is is even um, potentially losing here because of um, losing b6. I'm wondering about the a4 pawn here actually. Let's just check this again. <coughs> Running with the a4 pawn. So the valuation shifts. <laughs> so here I see not king c6. There's an even more accurate move if white retains the c4 pawn. Blimey. So king king c6, king b3, and then running with the a pawn should be okay here. Um, but okay, that that's about equal. But here c4, massive advantage to white. King b3 because of c5. Ah, because this pawn when it queens it's going to be check, and so this gate gains a big tempo. C takes. So white's queening first. <clears throat> Not very pleasant. So there's some intricacies here, and so I didn't really trust this end game at the time. It's sort of confirmed by deeper Rivka analysis that this isn't such an easy zugzwang as I first assumed when going to bed last night. Actually, on this position, and trying to visualise the position, I was thinking, did I really miss such an obvious possibility of just simplifying to a king and pawn ending? It doesn't seem so clear this position. So king d3, so g4, c4 is the saving move here, in theory. Um, king, so king c, king e4, um, and this this is kind of um, a path which um, is is just equal here. If the c pawns removed, then both sides are just queening. Right, I think that's just about equal. So back in the game, I avoided the king and pawn ending. I played actually knight e3, which I thought was a juicy looking move, the culmination of my dark square strategy from the opening, you know, from white's b5, I had put an echo onto the dark squares, dominating with a nice knight. I thought maybe the rook's more active than this rook. This is plain sailing, surely. What does he do about g2? Well, he plays actually g4, nice move. I'm thinking though, has it got a flaw? You know, this looks like a Alaska game, you know, Alaska Capitalanka in reverse, surely, with this deeply entrenched knight. I can peel open the H file. So with that in mind I play H five. And he doesn't want to create a, a weakness with G five. Um although Okay, I guess that's not, not too playable. Well, maybe H four, King F five, force knight E four, and then rook D one and then start trying to attack, you know, weaknesses. But he, he actually just played h3, inviting my rook to the second rank. So rook h8. Now check. And unfortunately, I'm getting like to five minutes left on my clock, and he's got about eight. And I couldn't see a clear path to victory here. I start fumbling around, and uh, we get a repetition draw now. I I just offer a draw here. It's it's like you know with White's control of. Um, you know, e4. There's no real exploitable weaknesses. So up and down game, um, full of, of drama and interesting opportunities. Uh, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.